Good morning or good afternoon for some of you. On behalf of VVOB, I would like to welcome you in this week's first thematic session on Reading for Meaning. My name is Kirsten Schraien and I'm a researcher and lecturer within the domain of multilingualism at Thomas More University of Applied Sciences and the University of Leuven. And I'm honored to be your host today. In the next hour and a half, four colleagues coming from Vietnam, South Africa and Belgium will briefly share their expertise on the issue of reading for meaning related to the multilingualism in their country. Yesterday's opening session already gave us some insights on multilingualism in these countries. And as an introduction, you also have had the opportunity to watch a pre-recorded version of today's talks. However, the presenters will be happy to share a short version of their talk today, leaving room for questions and discussions with you. So during the talks, you will have the opportunity to post some clarification questions in the chat box. Our moderators will pass these through, so to the presenters after each talk. You can also formulate more general discussion questions in the chat box. And these will be used during the Q&A discussion, so after all talks. And at the end of this session, I will also briefly explain the assignment we developed linked to today's topic. As you know, on November 23, we will have another Zoom meeting on this topic where we will discuss the outcomes of this um, assignment. And today, directly after today's session, so around 11 a.m., you will also have the opportunity to further chat with our presenters. So you are invited to stay in the Zoom session after 11 a.m. And then finally, some housekeeping rules. Please mute yourself, and of course, uh, the audience is muted, so mute yourself when you're not talking, and that is, of course, to minimize environmental noise. We also invite you to use the chat box to ask your questions, as I already mentioned. The working language is English, also in our chat box. However, do not hesitate to ask help if you're struggling to find a particular word, for instance. You know you can always send a private message, for instance, to colleagues in the chat box to um, ask for a translation. And please don't be shy to post your questions. This will make this session even more interesting, both for you and also for our presenters. You can also give a short reaction by using the reaction button, button which you will find below on your screen on the right hand side. And during the presentations, it is better to switch off your camera or to select the speaker's view in the Zoom settings to avoid distraction while listening to the presentations. Okay, now, before introducing our first presenter, we would like to get to know you a little bit better. So I would like to invite you to share your home country and name um, the name of your organization in the chat box now. So I will give you a few seconds to do so. Okay, it seems that we are quite a diverse group today, so perfect. I see participants from different countries already, so perfect. So now we're ready to give the floor to our first uh, presenter. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Professor Wu Ti Tang Huong from Vietnam. Professor Huong has a master's degree in sociolinguistics and a doctoral degree in linguistic anthropology. She has been working as head of the Applied Linguistics Department and as an associate professor, senior researcher and lecturer at Vietnam Linguistics Institute. Her research is focusing on linguistic politeness, language and social stratification, language variation and change, 
conversation analysis and intercultural communication, but also language and education policies and practices. She is particularly interested in the schooling of ethnic minority children in early primary grades in Vietnam. Today, she will talk about factors affecting reading performance of early primary grade students in Vietnam. Professor Huang, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Kirsten. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, as Kirsten said, I'm going to share with you some of my findings about the factors affecting early primary grade students' reading performance in Vietnam. Oh. I can't switch, sorry. Okay. Um, uh, in my talk, I'm going to provide some uh, context of my research, my research questions, the sample, the reading test. And uh, after that, I will briefly present the research results, the findings and some recommendations. Um, we all know that reading skill is the foundation for other learning activities at school. And we also know that a child who is behind in reading skills will also be behind in other activities. And this often results in the child's dropping out. UNESCO's uh, 99, uh, 2014 global report tells us that about 200 million primary school children in the world cannot read. And the international tests such as uh, PISA, TIMS, etc., show that the average child in underdeveloped and developed countries score one third those of an average child in developing countries. Research also showed that most tests are designed for children from grade four and up. And these tests do not tell us why exactly, whether the children have uh, poor scores because they do not know the contents or because they do not understand the exam papers. All this says that, uh, says about the importance of assessing early primary grad students' performance. Uh, in my talk, so my research was born in this context and I am asking two questions. First one, what is reading performance of grade one and grade two students in Vietnam? And what, what factors affect their reading performance? Uh, different factors may have different effects on children's reading performance. In this talk, I am focusing on two factors. The first one is the medium of instruction. And the second is family's socioeconomic background. My research was carried out in 2014. The sample consists of 1,079 grade one, 1,078 grade two students from 72 primary schools in six provinces across Vietnam. You can see the red squares on the map. From each school, 15 grade one and 15 grade two students were randomly chosen. You can see some uh, characteristics uh, of students on the slides. And uh, about 42.2 uh, grade one 
and 39.4 uh, grade two students are from ethnic minority groups. Based on the guidelines from RTI International, we developed the reading test for Vietnamese grade one and grade two students. Our test consists of eight reading components, P1 through P8, as you can see on the list, uh, the list on the slides. Let's now uh, have some look at some findings. On the slides, there are the results uh, of uh, the reading scores of King students versus ethnic minority students. The results show that uh, King students in both grades systematically outperform ethnic minority students in all reading parts. Um, there is also gap among ethnic minority uh, students themselves. You can see the reading scores for three biggest groups of ethnic minority students, the Hmong, Thai, and Jirai. For grade one, you can see that Thai students outperform Hmong and Jirai students uh, on all reading subskills. In turn, Hmong students also outperform Jirai students on all subskills. This pattern, however, does not hold for grade two students. Although Thai students still outperform Jirai students on all sub-skills. They underperform Hmong students on part two and part four. That's uh, part two is oral letter sound and part four is the uh, invented word reading. Jirai students also outperform Hmong students on P1, P5, sorry which is oral passage reading fluency and P8, which is dictation. This seems to suggest that the inter-ethnic gaps tend to get smaller as students move up grades. Now, um, in this research, we ask, if ethnic minority students who learn with a local teaching assistance in their classroom could do better than ethnic minority students who learn only with a Vietnamese teacher. The results show that in both grades, ethnic minority students who learn with teaching assistance um, would generally outperform students learning in class without teaching assistance. These findings suggest that the use of Vietnamese language together with the children's mother tongue through the presence of a local teaching assistant benefits students who have a limited Vietnamese proficiency. The qualitative data also reveal that the majority of parents, teachers, and education officials in the studied places express a strong support 
for the use of students' mother tongues in the first years of primary schools. You can read on the slide some voices of the teachers and parents. Um, and this, uh, on this slide, you can see the reading scores by students, family socioeconomic background. Uh, we can see that the students from better of family, which means they can provide their kids with better home learning environments, systematically outperform students from poorer families. So to sum up, my research has highlighted the following main findings. First, students are good at some reading sub skills, but poor, sorry, but poor at other important sub skills such as uh, invented word reading, reading and listening comprehension. We therefore, based on these findings recommend some specific changes in the curriculum and teaching practices for the Ministry of Education and Training. Second, the gaps between King and ethnic minority students and the gaps among ethnic minority students in grade one and the narrowing gaps in grade two suggest the role of school in reducing the intergroup differences. Some changes in the curriculum were also recommended to, um, the, um, to the Ministry of Education and uh, Training uh, to allow ethnic minority students to learn at their own pace while catching up with King students. Uh, third, the research also highlights the importance of home learning environment. It particularly highlights the positive impact of the use of ethnic minority students language together with Vietnamese as medium of instruction in early primary grades. We therefore strongly recommend to add this strategy to the different existing forms of bilingual education in the country for dealing with the language barrier in ethnic minority school. So this is all I have to share with you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Huang, for sharing your research on reading and especially highlighting, for instance, the added value of the teaching assistance uh, for minority learners. Um, now I would like to give the floor to the moderators, Jill and Emmeline, who will raise maybe some clarification questions from the aud audience for you. So ladies, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so far, the chat has been um, very quiet, so I think that everything has been uh, explained very well and that there are no questions. Um, unless somebody uh, wants to add a question now to the chat, then um, we might give some, some room there. But I don't see anybody uh, typing, so I think that everything um, is, uh, is clear. Um, but can I ask a question? Because I also thought it was very uh, interesting. Um, what, uh, what would your advice be for uh, teacher trainers um, or teacher education programs when it comes to reading? What kind of activities should they do to make sure that in future uh, teachers um, reading uh, activities will be properly um, done in classrooms? So how, how can we um, better train teachers um, to, to make sure that reading proficiency in classrooms um, increases for all learners? Um, in Vietnamese uh, schools, the practices of uh, teaching the reading and also testing, it just focus on um, 
reading fluency, especially for grade one and grade two. So this is why the, uh, the results uh, have highlighted that students are very poor at reading and listening comprehensions. Mm -hmm. And uh, so um, with the uh, uh, re uh, education reforms, which is uh, taking place in Vietnam right now, we um, have been uh, shifting, switching the attention from reading fluency for reading uh, for meaning. Um, so um, different uh, activities have been suggested to improve um, grade one and grade, uh, early uh, grade, uh, primary grade students' uh, comprehensions, um, storytelling, uh, role-playing activities, and uh, so um, uh, discussions, peer group discussions, dialogues with uh, friends, etc., are all activities which uh, encourage um, teachers to use uh, to improve students' vocabulary, active vocabularies, and also their uh, uh, their uh, understanding, their communication skills and listening skills. I'm okay. not sure I answer your question. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, I see that in the chat, uh, two uh, questions have popped up. The first one is a clarification question. And um, the question is, what uh, does the ethnic minority students mean? Who is that? Can you describe that a bit better? Huh? Can you say it again? Um, what means ethnic minority students? Okay, um, so uh, in uh, yesterday in my uh, talk about the country context, I mentioned that Vietnam, there are 54 uh, ethnic groups. The king uh, is the majority groups, which uh, accounts for uh, 84, more than 84 percent of the population of the country. The remaining 53 uh, ethnic groups are smalls and they um, account for 40 point something percent of the population. And so by uh, ethnic minority groups, um, we uh, mean um, the groups small, ethnic groups small in population in Vietnam. Okay, thank you. And the um, second question um, was more related to research and um, is um, that there uh, seems to be a gap in performance that is limited to P1, um, but increases in later grades. Any conclusions about that? Um, can you say it again? It seems that there is a gap in perform that it seems that the gap in performance is limited in P1, but is increasing in later grades. And um, any conclusions or thoughts on, on that? Uh, yes. Um, so um, on uh, P1, its uh, initial uh, sounds um, uh, recognition. And uh, uh, so uh, when um, in grade one students um, score, if I understand your question clearly, so uh, in grade two um, students score much uh, higher in, um, in grade two on P1 than in grade one. So this uh, suggests um, the, the improvement and the, you know, the, that uh, both uh, the good teaching um, methods, good uh, results, um, good um, teaching practices. And uh, this is also 
um, I think it it's, um, reflects the, the general picture of uh, reading activities uh, in primary school so far in uh, Vietnam. Students are fluent um, in um, reading, but they understand um, not much of uh, what they, they read fluently. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Hong, and thank you for the audience to pose all uh, questions. So I'm definitely, I'm sure that we can discuss it a little bit further, even during the general discussion. And then now I would like to uh, bring or, or to uh, move on to our next presenters. And our next presenter is Mrs. Ros uh, Mangel Parsat from South Africa. And Mrs. Mangal Parsat is a provincial English coordinator in the general education and training phase of the Department of Education in KwaZulu Natal in South Africa, where she facilitates the management and implementation of the curriculum. She enjoys coordinating programs that focus on promoting teaching uh, professional development and improving, improving the learning achievement. After a 24 year stint at the, as a teacher of English and Afrikaans in a secondary school, she practiced as a subject advisor for eight years already. And currently she is a PhD student pursuing her passion for teacher training development in inclusive teaching strategies. And today she will talk about refining the reading landscape in English first additional classrooms in South Africa. Mrs. Mangel Parsat, the floor is yours. Hello, and welcome to this presentation on redefining the reading landscape in English first additional classrooms in South Africa. I will be looking through the lens of the primary school reading improvement program to share best practice. This pro program is an in-service teacher training intervention which seeks to enhance the reading skills of learners in grades one to six. The presentation is done from the perspective of training English teachers in schools where there are various indigenous languages spoken as home language and English is spoken as a first additional language. PSRIP is an acronym for the program. It is a collaboration between three entities, the Department of Education, the organization that develops this program, the National Education Collaboration Trust, as well as the Training Authority for Education, Training and Development. Essentially, this means that the program adheres to policy and participating teachers can earn points for professional development. The PSRIP is implemented in all nine provinces in selected foundation phase and intermediate phase classes. It aims to capacitate and professionally, professionally develop teachers, school managers, subject advisors, and provincial coordinators how to teach reading for meaning. The latter are also trained to support teachers. PSRIP supports the transition of learners from mother tongue instruction in the foundation phase to English in the intermediate phase and beyond. Resources are provided in the form of structured lesson plans, worksheet and resource packs, training videos, as well as big books, phonic charts and display boards, the latter three of a foundation phase. The imperative to, prove, to improve reading aligns with the president's injunction 
that all 10-year-olds must be able to read with understanding. Although the PSRIP is not exclusively designed for the promotion of multilingualism, it is implemented in many schools that are characterized as multilingual. I will now begin with some of the strategies and I will start with the phonics review program. Teachers are trained how to teach English phonic sounds. This is because there are distinct differences in phonic sounds between English and indigenous African languages. Of course, there are some similarities as well. Many teachers who teach English as an additional language are not home language speakers themselves, and it is important for them to be familiar with the phonic sounds in English before teaching it to linguistically diverse learners in their classrooms. The next strategy that I want to look at is the teaching of theme vocabulary. Teachers are trained to teach new theme vocabulary using pats. This means that the teacher points to a picture or a real item, then acts out the theme word if possible. Thereafter, the teacher tells the learners what the theme word means using code switching. And finally, the teacher says the word in a sentence and learners are asked to repeat the word. Teachers are advised to select a wall in the classroom for theme displays of the theme vocabulary, phonic and sight words, as well as the pictures used. Since learners have an opportunity to view these words, since learners have, pardon me, since learners have an opportunity to view these words and items for the duration of a theme they will be continuously stimulated to learn as they look. The use of pictures and code switching is a powerful tool to promote multilingualism in classrooms. Theme teaching assists learners to learn language in context and supports understanding. I now move on with the core methodology. This methodology is unique to the PSRIP in South Africa. It is a methodology that informs the structured lesson plans that teachers are trained to use to teach the four language skills. As you can see from the slide, there are four basic stages, the pre-read, the first read, the second read, and finally, the post-read. In the pre-read, prediction, is used to build comprehension and storytelling skills using questions and discussions, example like, like looking at the title and pictures of text. Workbooks, by the way, are provided by the education department to every foundation phase and intermediate phase learner in home language and first additional classes. An extract of a story by Helen Keller will be used to explain the next two stages. In the first read, as you can see, um, the text is written in columns. And in the first read, the teacher reads the text modeling good reading skills. And as the teacher reads, the teacher explains the text to learners. He or she will also use code switching to assist learners to understand the text. And while the teacher is reading the text, he or she will also engage in think alouds as is shown in the second column. So the teacher models comprehension strategies like inference. After that first reading, learners are given an opportunity to answer questions and engage with some language structure in context. For the second read, we find that the teacher repeats the, fir the first three steps from the first read. However, in this stage, the teacher does not use code switching. 
So essentially, the teacher will read the first column, embedding meaning, using all the good reading practices. And while he or she is doing that, use comprehension strategies like is indicated in the third column. It will be interesting to note that here, new comprehension strategies are used. For example, here, the teacher demonstrates linking the test to his or her personal context and experience. Learners are then engaged in different activities like formulating questions and interesting, interesting enough, turning and talking with a partner or taking turns to read the story to each other. All the while, learners are praised for the work that they do. In the post-read, learners consolidate their understanding of their of the story and practice new comprehension skills. They engage in several activities like summarizing with a framework because they are first additional learners and need to be scaffolded. They also write about the comprehension strategy. So I have shared with you some of the strategies from the PSRIP that can be implemented in multilingual classes, and um, you can quickly glance through those. An evaluation of the PSRIP was done using a sample of 162 schools and 1,620 grade four learners after training in 2019. The findings of this evaluation indicates that there was good teacher development because it was noted that there were improved teaching and learning uh, practices demonstrated by teachers in this program. Baseline and endline changes in scores for reading comprehension, however, were quite small. However, the reading fluency improved by about 6.2%. What are some of the opportunities of the PSRIP program? It provides good training, access to teaching material, good methodologies and routines in the structured lesson plans. It recommends the use of code switching, which is viewed as something positive in multilingual classes. And there is very good collaboration between the various stakeholders. I am going to look at a challenge, uh, so, pardon me, a few challenges. However, there are not only challenges exist to the PSRIP, they are general challenges. Because PSRIP is not designed specifically to address multilingualism. However, it does recommend code switching, which unfortunately is frowned upon by some sectors in education with a reluctance to implement code switching. And of course, a gap between policy and practice to implement multilingualism is evident. The recommendation is that there should be a systemic overhaul in education and discussions should be initiated where multilingualism is not only embraced, but also promoted vigorously. The good news that I can share with you is that there are plans in 2021 to pilot translanguaging in some schools. If we look at teacher training, it should not remain in isolation while pre-service teachers are training, but it must translate into a seamless uh, cohesion with classroom implementation when those teachers do go to schools. And for this, good support is needed in the system from the school management team as well as officials. This brings me to the end of my presentation. I thank you for being part of it.
Thank you very much, Mrs. Mangal Parsan, for sharing this uh, current uh, reading and for meaning policy and also practices in South African schools. And I'm quite sure that the challenges, for instance, that you mentioned uh, in your presentation are also recognizable for the audience here. So let's immediately turn to the moderators, Jill and Emmeline again. Maybe there are some clarification questions. So uh, ladies, the floor is yours again. Well, for the moment, the chat is again um, quiet, but I think that people still need to gather their thoughts and, and maybe process a bit on, on what was being said. Um, but I would like to thank um, Ms. Rashila for the very interesting presentation because I learned uh, a lot. And, and maybe while we wait um, for the, the, the group to, to ask some question, maybe ask a question what her first thing um, or next step is um, with this uh, this project, what what is your main focus point now on on progressing with this? Okay, so um, to clarify, there are different cohorts that are chosen annually. The program starts in the foundation phase and then gradually progresses to the intermediate phase in schools. So the program does not. Uh, change drastically unless certain gaps have been identified. For example, in the COVID-19 pandemic, mm -hmm. lots of changes have to be effected because the, the, the lesson plans were not structured to accommodate the changes. So very quickly adaptations had to be made. And um, if you look at moving into the fourth industrial uh, revolution, we can see we are a little bit behind in South Africa. We're trying to embrace more technology. Uh, I can't speak for the uh, program managers, but I am sure they are going to start looking at more technology. At the moment, they are training videos that teachers can use, um, uh, as well as access all information on uh, online platforms, which are actually open resources and freely available for all. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, to some thank, you. thank you very much. I think that um, although uh, the whole COVID situation has indeed created a lot of problems and, and I don't want to minimize them, but I also think that it has created a lot of learning opportunities and created a need to um, embrace more technical uh, solutions for problems we otherwise solved in a different way. But I see that there is a, a question in the chat box um, that says um, that code switching is an opportunity, but accepting is, is a challenge. Um, and the question is, um, any suggestions on how to deal with the uh, accepting part? Um, so how can we um, make sure that code switching is, is used more? Um, that the whole acceptance of it is, is, is in, that it's embraced more. And I hope, Sophie, that I translated your question uh, properly. <laughs> okay, this is a very inter interesting question because the reluctance actually emanates from uh, people's perception that once they start learning English, they should not then be merging with their home languages. And I think many uh, amongst us today will agree that uh, parents are viewing English as the language of uh, improvement, upward, upward mobility, uh, um, economic opportunities. So it seems that they, they sense that if there is reverting to their home language, uh, children will be disadvantaged. And my suggestion would be that we need to have open and tra transparent conversations. Obviously, this thinking stems from a mindset um, that is still stuck in a certain uh, time period where people were denied opportunities. And now people need to see that um, code switching is not actually taking learners backwards, but it is actually supporting learners and it will help to improve learner performance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Mangal Parsat. And indeed, the code switching is a hot topic even in uh, other countries. Uh, so we definitely can uh, uh, discuss this a little bit more uh, during our general discussion. So uh, for the audience, I would like to invite them to prepare some of uh, some questions that we can use then later on. So thanks again. And then moving then to today's final presentation. And I'm delighted to introduce you to two of my Belgian colleagues, Mrs. Jona Hebrecht and Mrs. Marlies Alhut. Mrs. Hebrecht is a researcher and teacher trainer in the bachelor's program primary education at Odyssey University of Applied Sciences and her research focuses on reading policy. She's also the coordinator of the postgraduate program reception of minor non-native Dutch speakers and is one of the coaches of Pro Lesen, a professionalization course on reading policy. She contributed also to the manual full of language, Dutch didactics for primary school. And then Mrs. Algood is a researcher as well and teacher trainer in the bachelor's program at pre-primary education, also at Odyssey University of Applied Sciences. Her research focuses on stimulating emergent technical technical reading. And she also coordinates the postgraduate reading coach at Odyssey and writes stories, including teaching materials for early childhood education. Their key me message in the title is promising, everyone on the same page towards a successful reading policy. Mrs. Hebrecht and Mrs. Alhut, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yes, perfect. Okay, okay. Um, in this session, we will tackle three topics. Uh, first, we will talk about uh, the reading challenges in Flanders. Then we will very shortly guide you through the key ingredients of successful reading. And even more shortly, we will guide you with, uh, through the essential steps in constructing a sustaining reading policy plan. Um, here you can see just a selection of many news flashes in national media about reading challenges in Flanders. And uh, we don't have the time to, to look at them all, but what they tell us is that unfortunately, it's not only children or students who are having problems with reading, it's also our teacher trainers and even starting teachers for whom reading and reading motivation sometimes is a problem. These alarming messages are based on facts and figures. And first of all, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. okay. First of all, the Pearl study in 2016 showed very clearly that Flemish students in fourth grade have poor reading comprehension skills. The results marked a serious decline in reading comprehension skills compared to results of the Pearls test in 2006. And we already mentioned PEARLS, but also PISA confirmed the deteriorating results for reading comprehension of 15-year-olds. The Flemish government also organized language tests. And what is interesting is the fact that it was possible to find out which children performed less than others. And these results are very similar to the results presented by uh, Professor Hoor. As you can see, Boys achieve less in reading comprehension than girls. And children whose home language is not the instruction language, Dutch, do not perform as well as Dutch speaking children. And at last, children with low socioeconomic status achieve less compared to their classmates. This being said, it is important to remark that, of course, not all children speaking a home language other than the instruction language at school are under performance, but, as in many other domains of education, the children who are at risk the most are the non-native speakers that live in a low socioeconomic environment. However, PEARLS and PISA tests also showed a significant decline in reading results for all students, and also those students who have Dutch as their mother tongue and belong to high SES environments. Fortunately, 
researchers also found a number of positively related background characteristics, and you will recognize them from the other two PowerPoints. They explain why some children become or are better readers than others. First of all, the students are important. Students with a higher degree of autonomous reading motivation and a positive self-esteem concerning language learning skills perform better, no matter what their mother tongue is. And next to that, also non-native students who have intense contact with the Dutch language, for example, through media or cultural social activities, uh, they tend to be better readers. Next to that, the home environment is important. Students who grow up in a rich cultural environment and whose caretakers show a positive attitude towards reading and language skills are advantaged. And of course, also the teaching experience and the teaching methods seem to have an impact on the reading performances. These are very promising findings because concerning the topic of today, if we can heighten this student degree of autonomous motivation, if we can heighten family degree of cultural activities and positive, positive attitude, and of course, if we can provide schools with better teaching methods, reading should improve. Oh, and then we already go to the next topic, key ingredients of successful reading. To accomplish successful reading education, we encourage school teams to establish a sustainable reading policy. Successful reading education is a result of a combination of five aspects and they are all related to one another. And therefore school teams should focus on each of the five ingredients. In the following slides, we will zoom in on all these components of a successful reading policy. But first, let us have a closer look at the little circle in the middle that represents the multi-layered activity of reading. Some people think of the act of reading as a straightforward task that's easy to master. But in reality, and we all know that, reading is a complex process that draws on many different skills. And together, these skills lead to successful reading. A successful reading, a successful reader is a reader who reads accurately, fluently, and at a good pace on the one hand, and shows sufficient reading comprehension skills on the other hand, the left side. Who is a successful reader is a reader who is autonomously motivated to read. And that means the student reads because he wants to read, not because he has to read. And autonomously motivated readers read because they want to inform themselves or because they enjoy the activity of reading, not because someone tells them to read. At last, a successful reader is highly involved in his reading process and often reads a lot. Okay, let's return to the outer circle and the five key ingredients. We only have a little bit of time, so we will only give you a very quick overview. But please, if you get hungry and want to, want to know more, watch the video, which is uh, 23 minutes. So there we give more information. To start with, a shared vision, explicit, explicit goals and actions are very important. It's important for a school to really have a shared vision, the whole team on the same page. Um, and this vision then takes shape in goals. First, uh, broad goals, then explicit, explicit and specific goals. Then we go over to actions. We also urge schools to be realistic and to create a realistic time plan with short-term goals and long-term goals. We also urge schools to show their reading identity to visitors and to their pupils, so they can sense the reading atmosphere at the school. This implies the school should install powerful, literacy-rich reading spots in each classroom and in common places in the school. In short, it means school teams should make reading visible. Furthermore, should school teams should promote reading through group discussions, and it is vital that teachers themselves function as inspiring reading role models for the children. Lots of children struggle with reading, and they need specific instruction and practice to improve their reading skills and reading comprehension. 
Um, so this is a very important one. Uh, reading becomes functional when you relate the reading task to other subjects, to other language tasks. And it is very important then, uh, that when using reading strategies, teachers should explain to students why they use a strategy. They should model them and describe expli explicitly how it's used. Of course, uh, pupils can, only, can also learn from one another and of course, differentiated instruction and support of the diverse needs of the students is crucial. The fourth key ingredient of a successful reading policy plan is monitoring. Monitoring the reading process of students should involve reading accuracy and fluency and reading comprehension, but also reading motivation and behavior. Knowing students' reading interests will help school teams to connect students with books and other re reading materials they will enjoy. The reading process of students should be monitored in different ways and using different instruments. It's essential to learn about what motivates students to read, but also to find out what can cause trouble with reading. And keep in mind, of course, that having reading difficulties in the instruction language does not mean a child isn't smart. Maybe a multilingual child does not have a sufficient voc vocabulary to comprehend the text, but therefore it can be very helpful to discuss the meaning of unknown words before reading the te text and to link those words to the home language of the child, as uh, was mentioned in the previous pre presentation. And then the fifth key ingredient, um, as the previous key ingredients already show, reading education is a complex job. Therefore, school teams are encouraged not to work alone, but to work together as a team and also to involve students and parents. Even libraries, reading promotion organizations can play an important role, should play an important role in setting up a reading policy. These were the five key ingredients. Now let's move over to essential steps in constructing a sustainable reading policy plan. And we will keep this very, very short. Indeed, Marlies. A successful reading policy plan is the result of a systematic process. It means you have to scan, you have to plan, you have to implement a number of actions, and of course, you have to evaluate, evaluate and celebrate uh, what worked and then scan again. Schools should have a good idea of the strengths and weaknesses of their reading education. And from there on, set up specific reading actions. So conclusion, effective reading education is a result of teamwork. Get everyone on the same page and make every child a child of books. Thank you very much for sharing your insights, uh, ladies, and, and especially on how uh, an adequate reading policy could look like. Uh, it's very promising. So I would uh, like to give the floor again to the moderators, because maybe there is a question now. So ladies, the floor is yours again. Thank you uh, again. Um, again. Um, oh, no, here we are. Um, there's a question, there are actually two questions, um, and I'm going to read them uh, out loud. What is meant by a rich cultural environment for reading? Could you give examples or activities um, that can be done in the family context? And um, I maybe I'll immediately add the, the, the second question uh, as well. Um, what is the attitude of a teacher that is an inspiring reading model? How could a teacher show that he or she is a role model to students concretely? So mm -hmm. um, examples of activities um, to be done in a family context for a rich cultural uh, environment and, and, it, and how could a teacher show that he or she is a role model? Ladies. Yona, will you uh, take the floor first? <laughs> okay, I'll take the floor. Uh, maybe I'll start with uh, the last question and uh, how uh, can teachers be inspiring role models? I think it's very important that um, teachers themselves are enthusiastic about reading, enthusiastic about books. Um, and this means there has to be time in the classroom. There has to be um, 
teachers should create opportunities to talk about books, to present books to the, um, to the students, to read aloud, um, encouraging uh, stories, uh, to use stories and books in different domains, uh, not only during the language lessons, but also during, um, for instance, maths or um, um, uh, world uh, sciences, um, uh, even um, in um, uh, mathematics, you can start with a with a nice uh, story, for instance, of or a poem to start the day, to end the day. So, if you use literature as a teacher a lot, if um, you make uh, your students acquainted with uh, different reading materials, there is a higher opportunity that uh, they can explore their own reading preferences. Uh, and furthermore, there should be time. To, for, for group discussions on uh, literature. It's not only the teacher who should uh, tell about uh, their own reading preferences, but also um, they should uh, create opportunities for the students themselves to bring books to the classrooms, to tell about uh, and to talk about reading materials. Uh, they should create opportunities um, where um, students can explore different reading materials, they can go to the libraries uh, together with the students, but they should guide the, the students to, um, to discover their own uh, reading interests. And uh, that is something we notice that teachers still find difficult to do. Mm -hmm. There's very little to add. Uh, but maybe this one, which is very concrete and I think is a very good example. A teacher should always have a book on his or her table. Just a book that he or she's reading in that makes the children curious. And there should be a, a, a place for reading in the class. Nice uh, library, nice place to sit and read. That was yeah. the last question. Um, Maybe just one final remark, though. Um, we also see that a lot of teachers um, start to create um, or make room in the classroom for uh, free reading. Uh, this, so uh, teachers and uh, use a book and students can use a book uh, or select a book from the classroom library and start reading. There is time for spontaneous reading. But in this case, it's very um, important that the teacher themselves as also read or uh, that they help um, and guide uh, the students to find a book uh, or a reading material that suits them. Okay, I'm, I'm going to direct the question a bit more to the family context because another question yes. popped up about the family context. Um, in, 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 in an extra question that was added um, was uh, on how do you see families supporting their, their children's uh, reading practices. So we already have a question on uh, a rich cultural environment for reading in a family context mm -hmm. and added to that is how can you as a family uh, support your children's uh, reading practices. Okay, uh, I think there are uh, plural aspects uh, concerning uh, this question. What, what really is helping and that's that's and maybe an easy one is that at home there are reading materials. Um, even in the toilet there can be a newspaper. Of course, I know people in low socioeconomic situations often don't have the opportunities to, to have a lot of reading materials. But of course, if you as a parent are an inspiring role model as well and you read a lot, that's a big help. That's one thing. And then, of course, if you show, like in the PowerPoint, PowerPoint was said, if you show how important you think reading is and you help your child when it's reading or you're just interested and you are asking, oh, what are you reading? Tell me about it. That's a small, concrete thing a parent can do as well. Yuna? Yes, I'm free to... Uh, add something because you already mentioned, Marlies, that it's not evident, it's not um, easy for uh, a lot of families in uh, low socioeconomic situations um, to provide their children with, with uh, reading materials. And there's an important uh, task for the school as well. Uh, so um, schools can make uh, reading uh, materials accessible uh, for children at home. So they can, for instance, um, go to the libraries uh, together with the families or uh, um, 
teachers can uh, allow uh, students to take reading uh, materials uh, with them at home. Um, but parents can also be invited uh, to read aloud in classrooms, uh, even in their own uh, mother tongue. Uh, we have a number of um, uh, good examples in Flanders where uh, uh, parents read aloud in their in Turkish or in, in um, Arabic languages, and then uh, the child, for instance, can translate uh, to their classmates. And in this way, the um, multilingualism is uh, presented as something positive and not as uh, um, something ne negative or as uh, an obstacle for reading. Uh, so that's also something that's very important to help and to guide parents um, to find reading uh, materials and to welcome them in the classroom, even if uh, Dutch is not or uh, the instruction language is not their mother tongue. Okay, and I'm gonna wrap this uh, topic uh, up here because I'm looking at the time as well. And there's one um, very specific question as well, and that's a question on research of the impact of teachers' own reading attitudes on reading results of learners. Um, so maybe, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing there is research on that. Um, maybe you could provide the links in the chat box um, so that um, Lever and everybody else can uh, look up those um, sources if they if they want. Uh, and then I can give the floor back to Kirsten to go to the general uh, Q and uh, A. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Jill. And thank you very much, Mrs. Alhut and Mrs. Hebrecht for uh, sharing also your ideas and thoughts based on the audience questions. So again, I would like to thank, of course, today's uh, presenters. And now, as Jill just said, I would like to open our general Q&A discussion. And um, we suggest that we will start with some uh, general questions. Uh, maybe there are some additional questions uh, or there are coming some extra questions. And after that, uh, or I would also like to invite our presenters uh, because maybe you have a, uh, have a question for our uh, audience. So uh, don't hesitate to uh, formulate your question. Um, so I'm not sure, Jill, is there already a question or should we pop up one question first? Well, there, is, there, there is one question that I think was probably for the last presentation, but I think it's a good question to open a general uh, Q&A, okay. namely, um, should reading materials be developed based on local cultures and is this one ingredient? Um, so I, I think that's actually a really good question to start mm -hmm. the Q&A, namely, how does good reading material um, how do you create good reading uh, materials and how much of a link should there be with the local culture? Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> Mrs. Alhut of Mrs. Albrecht, are you willing to answer this question or should we ask it to the other ones? Mm, well, I'd say uh, the more the better. Uh, we know, especially in pre-primary school, that children are excited when they can find uh, reading materials in their own language or concerning their own culture, if that's a, a subculture, if that's not the main culture. So yes, please. And that should be available at school. Mm -hmm. I think uh, reading materials sh should um, be like a sort of mirror of uh, the diversity in the in society, but also the di diversity in the classroom. And um, research show that um, readers tend to um, be more uh, involved if they can identify with the main characters. So it's very uh, important that in the reading materials there are enough uh, opportunities to identify with the, with the cultural, with the cultural activities and with the identity of the characters. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank what do you they say? Me. You have to, uh, reading should be a mirror and reading should be a, a window. A window, yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Other questions uh, in the chat box already, um, Jill? No, that's so far the, the only one. Okay, so maybe we can also pop up a question then. So um, it's, it's a question for the presenters at first, but of course, audience is also free to, to come in. And of course, if you want to add something yourself, you can just unmute yourself, also the audience, and uh, just uh, give your comment. But uh, maybe for the presenters, in, in your view, um, who do you think that the key players are? Uh, we are talking about reading uh, improvement, or we are talking about trying to, to uh, set up the policies. And in most cases, there is 
is a policy, there are practices, but who do you think that are, that are the key players when it comes to reading improvement? What is the role of different actors and which are the, the um, let's say, the, the leading actors uh, in, in getting our children better uh, to, to become better readers? So uh, I'm not sure, Mrs. Mangel Parsat, do you want to comment first? So you have to un unmute yourself. I... Or maybe Professor Hong, do you want to comment on this? So who do you think that are key players uh, for reading improvement? Uh, well, I think the teachers should be the key players for uh, the improvement of my reading performance of students. Um, textbook compilers and uh, mm -hmm. they do their own jobs, but how to implement all the materials uh, in uh, classroom practices is the job of the teachers. So I think uh, teachers um, and teachers training is very important in, in, in this. Um, besides, uh, I also agree with uh, previous comments that um, parents should also uh, play an active part in, in helping uh, supporting children's uh, in, uh, reading practices and by helping their children um, in many ways, like you mentioned before, creating a rich uh, cultural environment and providing children uh, with uh, reading materials, etc., um, uh, uh, etc., in the homes, so they can encourage and stimulate children's uh, reading um, habits, ambitions, and also interest in reading. Uh, but I um, think that teachers should be the key players in, in this uh, endeavors. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Mrs. Albrecht or Mrs. Alhut, do you want to comment also on this question? Yes, I think one of the components of a reading policy plan to us is a great uh, reading network. Uh, and of course, uh, the, the teacher is crucial in uh, the reading process, but uh, there should be connections with librarians, with, uh, for instance, illustrators or authors um, being invited in the classroom or um, yeah, working together as teachers. So I think um, reading is such a complex task that uh, teachers should also invite other people uh, to guide them and um, to, to work together uh, on this demanding task. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. And we also sh see a tendency now in Flanders last years, for example, libraries uh, now want to take an active role, they want to go to schools, they want to help. So that's a change that is uh, occurring. Okay. And, and indeed, and, and even in Belgium, you have more and more libraries that also welcome the multilingualism and uh, even have speci uh, especially developed uh, yeah, books, etc., to stimulate that multilingual reading as well. So thank you for uh, this uh, comments or your, your opinion here. And I just noticed, I think we have some more questions from the audience. So Jill, yes. up to you. Indeed, uh, there is a, a question on uh, if there is research about reading attitudes in uh, higher SES households, um, because several school leaders in the Netherlands have told the asker of the question um, that they have difficulties in getting their rich parents um, to get their children uh, to read um, and that the parents don't like to do it. And they, they asked her if there is an app for that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, any any comments or um, answers uh, to that? Is there anyone from the presenters who wants to comment on that, or maybe someone from the audience who has uh, knowledge about this type of research? I don't know if there is research, and I do recognize the, the tendency, but in most cases, it's not a problem because all the other uh, conditions 
for a good reason foundation are there. Mm -hmm. I even have to admit that I didn't always have time to read for my children. I didn't ask for an app though, but, <laughs> and still they are good readers. But I, I can um, follow the reaction of Marlise and um, certainly of, of the person who asked the question because uh, we um, see that um, not only the results for reading comprehension deteriorated uh, the last uh, few years, but certainly for uh, reading motivation. And uh, the Netherlands, um, it is uh, a big problem as well. Uh, there have been a lot of uh, actions um, Posted by the government to to enforce uh, reading motivation, and this uh, the deteriorating tendency of reading motivation is not only uh, something uh, that uh, we see with uh, Dutch speakers, but also with uh, uh, but with uh, non-native speakers, but also with uh, Dutch speakers, and also uh, with students who uh, grow up in high stress environments. So um, we really have to focus on reading motivation as well, next to reading uh, accuracy. And and reading comprehension. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Correct. Okay, another uh, question, Jill? Yes, um, there is a question on the fact that um, for some children, um, it's not just the material that's a problem, but also finding time and especially a place uh, to read, because not, every, not, not everybody has a quiet place to read, mm -hmm. um, or because they have to have uh, they have to help in the householding. Um, they are not allowed to go to the library by themselves because it's too far from their homes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the question is this: Okay, so we've besides the material uh, aspect, we've got a number of practical questions, uh, practical, practical uh, issues. How can we uh, bridge that gap? Gap? How can we uh, help them and overcome that problem? Okay, so that's maybe a question for uh, Professor Wong or Mrs. Mann uh, Helparsat. Are you there already, or? Hi, um, can you go? Yes, okay. yes, Rashila. So, okay. what is your what are your thoughts here? Yes, I do understand um, the fears of parents to send their children out of home and so on. But I'd like to share with you something that uh, our education department has done in light of the challenges with regards to poverty-stricken homes where children don't have access to a uh, reading material. I'm going to hold up something that I have. Mm -hmm. So this is an example of what I refer to as a workbook uh, mm -hmm. developed by the Department of uh, Education. It is intended for learners to be given these workbooks for uh, engagement in the home. And it mm -hmm. is there to close the gap between learners who have resources and those who don't have. So I just thought of sharing what we are doing in South Africa to ensure that every child has some reading material to take home. I mm -hmm. hope that is helpful. Yeah, so that there is access to uh, reading material as well as home. And I think that's a very nice example. I'm not sure uh, uh, about the situation in Vietnam. So Professor Huang, is that something that you also recognize from um, practices in, in Vietnam? Probably yes, with all the remote areas. So what yes, is your comment I, here? I, I think um, this is a very familiar picture now for the remote um, and mountainous area in Vietnam. And um, uh, many children do not uh, have uh, any books to read at home. Uh, so the only place that they can read is at school. So I think school libraries and uh, reading corner um, now uh, reading corners uh, in the classroom and uh, different uh, reading activities provided by the teachers in the classroom is uh, crucial for um, these uh, children in um, remote and mountainous areas in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And um, one comment um, was mentioned before that uh, it would be wonderful if we could have uh, um, resources um, published uh, uh, based on local language and also in uh, the languages of the children. But unfortunately, as I mentioned yesterday, um, among uh, 
um, 100 languages in Vietnam, only about 30 languages uh, have a scripts and uh, only eight languages are being taught as subjects in Vietnam. So uh, it's still a, uh, a very far away uh, from having reading materials for children in their own uh, language and also based on their, uh, on their own cultures, local cultures. So um, a good um, library, uh, school library systems and uh, reading activities in class. And I al also think that um, school can allow students to borrow books home um, so that they can read to their liter illiterate parents and um, that may uh, improve their motivation and interest in reading. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yes, indeed. I, I totally agree with that. So I'm moving to Jill through, uh, back. So any additional questions? I saw, well, um, in, in, in the chat, there is a lot of answers to the question as well, where um, the, the idea of mobile libraries um, is, is going around. Uh, we've got an example from South Africa and, and England. Um, then we've got the mention of uh, the Brussels libraries that have access to online uh, a mm -hmm. library. Um, it's probably mostly in Dutch and maybe some French, but it can be interesting for uh, an international population as well as it's online. Um, then there is also the mentioning of, of schools that are allowing um, children to take books at home. Um, and uh, the reaction that, okay, schools allow uh, materials to get um, home, mm -hmm. but what about helping them, um, finding them a uh, time and a quiet place in a very chaotic household to read them? Um, and I'm, no, I'm here as a moderator, but could I maybe also add something? Uh, to of course, this? of course. <laughs> um, it's, it's, I, I always find it hard to be the one that passes uh, questions uh, to another one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, I, I also worked on a project where, um, it, where we worked on, on um, validating linguistic diversity and reading uh, elements were part of that as well. Um, and um, we also provided sort of backpacks with materials um, to give students, um, to, to, to give students and, and um, to take with them at home. Sorry, I couldn't, couldn't find the words there. Um, but what we also did was try to include parents in what you do and get that uh, parent-teacher interaction and, and get them to, to really be aware of the fact of why it is important that they take up this material and they let their kid work with the material or just uh, go through it. Um, and um, you cannot ask them to change their household in a way that you cannot ask them to change their um, interior design or whatever. I mean, you can, but I mean, you cannot uh, oblige them to do that. But the more you make parents aware of the, ne yes. the need to, to let a kid go through the materials, and even if it's just a sort of even a comic book, but just that to lower that step towards picking up a book, um, that that is a very important role for them as a parent to take up and just make them aware of that, that can already um, bridge that gap a bit. It's not, I mean, it's it's not a one size fits all answer. It's not something that's going to solve mm -hmm. all the problems. But the more you get parents into that mindset that they can play a role as well, even without maybe being a good reader, uh, but just by facilitating it, it can uh, stimulate uh, a lot as well. And I see that um, there is uh, an input from Ellen Rose on uh, the uh, multilingual platform Story Weaver. Um, that has a number of different uh, stories in many different uh, language. languages. Um, so um, that, that can be interesting for anybody uh, as well. But um, I'm going to switch back to my moderator uh, role and ask uh, the presenters if they have uh, something else uh, to add on the questions, um, something else on the question on uh, how to, um, yeah, create the home, uh, the home environment uh, for reading and Whilst doing that, I'm going to keep on reading the chat because uh, the chat is becoming quite active now. <laughs> okay, perfect, perfect. So we still have a few minutes, only a few minutes. So if you want to add another question, so don't hesitate now. So, but for the presenters, maybe, yeah, you can comment on what Jill just said, or um, do you maybe have a question for the audience? Because that could also be the, the case. So uh, is there any question or any additional comment from your side? 
Um, maybe I, I would just like to add uh, to the, the comments of Jill um, that uh, in various teaching programs in uh, Flanders, we encourage our students, our future teacher teachers to go to the family homes to read aloud to the children so the parents can actively see and uh, observe what reading can do. So uh, that's something that happens in teacher training departments. Okay, thank you. And uh, Professor Huang or um, Mrs. Uh, Mangal Parsa, do you have additional uh, comments or a question for the audience, maybe? Roshila, yes. Uh, hi. Yes, I'd like to know what um, what is the thinking about um, using authentic texts to promote multilingualism. Uh, I think we don't talk about it enough. What I see happening is that publishers uh, produce material and they have uh, integrated different cultures. Um, if we are looking at authentic English texts, for example, I see the authenticity uh, being hidden slightly so if you want to expose a learners from a language to another language, uh, what do you think about using the authentic text? For example, uh, not changing names, if it is an Afrikaans text, for example, in South Africa, that you would use a name like Marie or Johan instead of changing it to John or Mary. Mm -hmm. So and to overcome the cultural bias, you mean, that's, that's what you mean, eh? so that we, we, how do we or should we overcome the, the, the cultural bias by, by just sticking to and, and keeping and respecting the, the original uh, culture of the people who are reading the materials? That's, that's your question. Yes, what do you think about it? Yes, yeah, so is there anyone in the audience that would like to... Um, to comment on this or answer this question. So you can just unmute yourself or one of the other presenters can also pop in here. Maybe I can uh, already comment. I'm a little bit, or I have an, a different perspective because I'm a speech language pathologist, but I think that we also in, in uh, speech language pathology and so when dealing with bilingual children, we try to uh, more and more adapt more and more uh, assessment batteries also to make sure that we overcome that uh, cultural bias. And I think if we um, look at uh, language assessment batteries or reading uh, batteries, that we used 10 years ago in, in, uh, and that we use now, I think there's already a huge evolution and a huge difference so that we really try to uh, take into account that cultural bias. And so from my perspective, I think it's very important that we uh, make sure that the material that we use, that it's culturally adapted. And, and thus, uh, like you said, for instance, in keeping the original names and to, and to make it very uh, recognizable for the children who read that material. Because we do know, as already said also by Mrs. Hebrecht and Mrs. Algut, that for instance, um, reading pleasure and, and yeah, getting to know the things that is, is uh, quite important when you, when you want that children start uh, reading and, and are motivated to uh, read as well. So that's my small comment here uh, from more a broader perspective. I'm not sure, Jill, is there any other comments here or someone who wants to add to that? In the chat that it's mainly going about um, why you can find materials. Um, okay. but what well, it is and reading. Um, so anybody who is uh, trying to find uh, reading materials or multilingual reading materials, go to the chat because it's 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 quite it's, it's quite resourceful. Um, but uh, maybe one thing that I can add uh, as well here, very short because I'm looking at the time, yes. is that um, of course, I mean cultural um, elements have to be in there because it helps to identify with the text mm -hmm. and that. But when it comes to authentic materials, I always think about. Um, Authentic materials being things that are um, there um, in in the 
original country where the language um, is, is used. Mm -hmm. um, so depending on what language you're teaching. Um, but you authentic for me means also that you not necessarily change the level to uh, the level of the learners. And when it comes to authentic materials, I think that, of course, um, it needs to be authentic in a way that it has to be believable, um, that you have to um, mm -hmm. you know, make sure that that your your text is, is yeah, believable, if to put it like that. But on the other hand, you also have to make sure that the level of the learner is taken into account. So if you need to adapt your text to become it more manageable for the reader, um, then make it a bit less authentic, to put it like that, yeah. so that the, the language level is not too high. Mm -hmm. um, so um, there we go. Um, yeah. That's my uh, short addition to the comments that have been uh, made. Perfect. So um, indeed, looking at the time, I think we have to almost close this session. So, but before we, uh, first of all, of course, thank you for all your questions, for sharing, also um, the presenters, of course. And but at the beginning, I promised you to briefly introduce you to, to the assignment uh, for next Tuesday. So um, today, Mrs. Hebrecht and Mrs. Alglut uh, give, uh, or they gave uh, an insight in the key ingredients of a successful reading policy. And in, the, in addition, Professor Wong and Mrs. Mangel Parsat talked about some risk factors affecting the reading uh, performance of children and also some key uh, components of the primary uh, reading um, improve, improvement programs. So we would like to invite you uh, to take a look again at some of the key ingredients of a successful reading policy and to reflect on how each of these are implemented in the reading policy of your school. So, or the school that you um, did an internship in. Um, so we invite you to describe some strengths and also some weaknesses or some operating points, you could say. And we also want you to think of um, how a school can integrate multilingual strategies to overcome potential risk factors that were raised already eh, earlier today and where these would fit into the reading policy framework. So we really want to bridge the three presentations in this assignment. And we also would like to invite you to bring a good practice to develop adequate reading skills of uh, multilingual children and uh, maybe if you have observed uh, some of these children or you worked with them yourself. So what are your good practices? We are very happy to learn about these as well. And then uh, I think that uh, Sutkin will share uh, the assignment in the chat box so that you all have access to it. And then having said this, it's now time to close today's session. And I, again, I would like to thank today's presenters, uh, Professor Wong, Mrs. Uh, Man Jan Parsat, Mrs. Hebrecht and Mrs. Algut. I also would like to thank you for sharing, for your participation, for your interaction. And of course, I hope to see you again on November 23 uh, for the, the discussion session. And of course, or maybe some uh, at the closing uh, session on November 26. Or maybe you're even registered for the other thematic sessions. So those who want to chat more directly with today's presenters, they can just stay in this Zoom session now. And for all the others, uh, I would like to thank you and hope to welcome you again soon. <laughs>